Today's interview is going to be a little shorter than normal. We would normally go until 12.30, but Kay has a meeting to go to, so we're going to be concluding at 12.10, which means I won't give her the full, fulsome, <laughs> huge introduction that she, that she deserves, because that would take about 40 minutes, given everything she's done uh, in Virginia, in the United States, uh, Virginia's Secretary of Health and Human Resources, President George W. Bush's Director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, many more leadership roles. So let's just dive in right away. In your book, What I Wish I'd Known Before I Got Married, which is a great <laughs> name for a book, you wrote that you wanted to become a mother, and this is capital M, a mother within the black church community defined as, quote, a well-respected woman with worn knees, a well-used Bible, candy in her purse for children, who has earned the privilege of saying exactly what she thinks, end quote. <laughs> now, can you do that as president of the Heritage Foundation? <laughs> I certainly can, and uh, I am so pleased to announce that, uh, that my fellow Christians uh, within the African-American community, even though I have been largely involved in a PCA church for most of my adult life, mm -hmm. and they would find the term Mother James anathema, uh, have decided that I have earned the title, and you may call me Mother James. <laughs> okay. Well, Mother James, <laughs> I'm going to quote from what you were saying five years ago when we were right here in this spot, and that you were in a very different position. But here's, here's what you said, and I'd just like to hear thoughts on it now. I feel like I'm on CNN where they roll the old tapes and you have to answer for what you said. <laughs> oh, but, these, but these, are, these are good old tapes. I was, okay. Uh, I'm delighted that you're in your position with Heritage now. I was very impressed with your candor five years ago. Uh, but you said, I met recently with young African-American conservative professionals and said, I have a news flash for you. The cavalry is not coming. There is no one coming to save us. The conservative movement, the evangelical movement, and the Republican Party don't care about us anymore, mm. end quote. Did I say that? You said it. <laughs> uh, but do they care now? Have things changed? Uh, well, I think that they are learning to care, and I think they understand how important it is to care. Um, I think that there are four constituencies that if you love this country, you recognize that it is important to spend time, energy, resources in those various communities for your own self-interest and for the preservation of liberty and freedom in America. That's cultural elites, minorities, women, and millennials. Okay. If we as conservatives care about this country then we recognize that uh, we, we must speak to, in compelling and winsome ways, those various communities in order to maintain freedom and liberty. And unfortunately, um, I think that's a hard lesson to learn. I think that when I look at so many of our wonderful conservative organizations, they are comfortable just staying within and preaching to the choir instead of being evangelical with a small e and recognizing that with the constituencies that we currently have, we cannot maintain. And so it is vital, it is critical. It, I, 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 I wanna send a rallying cry that we must, if we love this country, figure out how to grow our movement. And I think that five years later, that, that is becoming more and more clear. I've been saying it for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that people are coming to terms with that. Um, and, and I think, you know, when you, you look at the fact that I have been saying this for quite so long and being quite outspoken about it, the fact that as the board of directors of the Heritage Foundation sat around the boardroom table and looked at all the incredible candidates uh, that uh, were uh, being uh, reviewed as president, that they chose someone who has as a passion growing our movement. So you've always been a grower. You've been a change agent. 
-hmm. How are you going to change heritage? <laughs> well, I, I'm fond of saying that the Heritage Foundation is both a masterpiece and a work in progress. And you can be both at the same time. There's no other organization in the country, indeed in my opinion, in the world, better positioned to take on the fight for liberty and freedom than the Heritage Foundation. Uh, having said that, are there things we can do better? Are there things we can do faster? Are there audiences that we have not reached that we should? I would answer absolutely to all those questions. So my job is to maintain the culture of the Heritage Foundation, stay true north to the things that we believe. We are not going to change our beliefs, our philosophy, or our ideology to win any particular constituency, but boy do I think we have to think through newer, more creative ways of articulating what we believe in order to win those audiences. Okay, so without changing what Heritage has stood for and what Heritage believes, how are you going to appeal to the cultural elites? Well, you know, I have to appeal to their intellectual honesty. How much of that is there? <laughs> There's not a lot of that out there, There's I must that. confess. So typically one of the first things I ask when I am engaging is, um, are you prepared to be intellectually honest? Most people, when you ask that question, will say yes, because they know that's something they ought to be. That's the right answer. Yeah, that's the right answer is to be yes. So the second question I ask is, will you give me the freedom to call you on it when you're not? And typically what they say is, of course, as long as I have the same freedom to call you. I said, great. As long as we can call each other out when we're not being intellectually honest, that's fine. And as long as we establish that you're entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to your own set of facts. And that's one of the things that I believe that the Heritage Foundation contributes to the battle, to the cause. We do the research. We do the analysis. We write the papers that can fuel the entire rest of the conservative movement. And incidentally, uh, by the way, this is not gratuitous in any way. I do mean this sincerely. That's one of the reasons I'm so excited about being here at Patrick Henry, because this is the farm team here. This is where these young intellectuals sharpen their skills and uh, learn how to think through issues, rely on data and research, and are able to defend what they believe. Those are the folks that we look for uh, to be the soldiers in the battle as they graduate and come to the Heritage Foundation. And they'll be quoting you on that as they apply for internships. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Not just internships, but jobs. Um, so once I lay the foundation for uh, engaging el cultural elites in you know, intellectual honesty, uh, the ability to call them on it when they're not, to agree on a common set of facts. Now, that's the tough one, uh, yeah. because today it, it used to be much easier to get to that point. But I have to tell you, the biggest issue that we have to overcome to win cultural elites is that we are dealing with a, an entire generation and class of people who do not know how to be critical thinkers, mm -hmm. how to deconstruct an argument. And uh, so very often it's based on, well, I feel in my opinion, and, and those feelings and those opinions are typically not based on anything other than some talking points they just pulled off Facebook. So let me ask you about conversing with a person actually who's a member of the cultural elite, uh, a person who emphasizes feelings a lot, and a person from a minority group. Let's say, instead of me sitting here, someone much more persuasive like Oprah Winfrey. Oh, I'm looking Democratic. forward to that one. Okay, what would you say to her? <laughs> you know, actually I think Oprah Winfrey and I could find a lot of common ground. I have genuinely a great deal of respect for her uh, personally. And I know her from watching and having met her a couple of times in life that, uh, that we share a common vision. I don't want to see poor people poor. She doesn't either. 
I don't want to see kids trapped in failure factories and unable to get a great education. Neither does she. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see access to quality health care denied to those who desperately need it, and neither does she. I think where the difference comes in is our approach to how to solve those problems. So the first thing I would do with Oprah is lay out the common ground and to appreciate who she is as a person and her desire to solve difficult problems for hurting people because I'm right there with her. Now, after that, I think I would have to say, are you willing, Oprah, to set everything aside and let's look at things that work? Take education as an example. When I am dealing with young progressives on college campuses, I like to put up a picture of a kid who is obviously from an impoverished background. And I tell them that my children and my grandchildren have someone who's crazy about them. And that's me. I am crazy about my grandchildren, and I will take on anything and anybody to equip them to be educated and to be able to survive in this world. But that poor kid whose picture I put up deserve someone who is crazy about them as well and who's willing to take on teachers' unions, who's willing to take on school administrators, who's willing to do whatever is required. I'm not advocating on behalf of teachers or unions or anybody else. They've got a union. I'm advocating on his behalf. So let's look at what really works for that kid. Are you willing to do that and set aside politics, set aside labels, set aside talking points, set aside advocating on behalf of anyone other than that kid? And if you lock Oprah Winfrey and me in a room for an hour, I'll bet we could come out with some solutions for that kid. Well, I'd hope so, but let's say Oprah Winfrey responds to that persuasive argument with two words, Donald Trump, uh -huh. and what? What's that got to do with anything? Well, you're the president of the Heritage Foundation. The Heritage Foundation's a conservative organization. You're glad to have Donald Trump in the White House. And he is a person, let's say Oprah Winfrey would say, who has demonstrated a total lack of compassion. What well, do you do with that? Well, first of all, uh, as the president of the Heritage Foundation, I am delighted that I no longer have to be involved in politics. Okay. Um, and we are not an arm of the RNC or the Trump administration. We are here to promote conservative philosophy, ideas, and policies. And whenever the RNC or the Trump administration veers from that, we take them on as much as we do Democrats and liberals. So I have been set free from all of that, and I'm able to deal um, based on ideas and things that work. And I would also say to Oprah that, you know, when someone is dying in a desert and a hand reaches out to give them a cup of water, if it's real water that will really quench the thirst, do you think that person is going to knock the hand away because it's somebody they don't like, admire, or respect? So if Donald Trump at this particular moment, uh, take Trump out of the picture and look at the cup of, cup of water. Is it real? Will it quench the thirst? Will it solve the problem? And I don't care who it's coming from, if it's a real solution, I'll take it. Okay, so Oprah Winfrey then says, well, tell me about the You cup. are beginning to look a lot like Oprah Winfrey oh, no. right now. <laughs> so, but, but she says, well, tell me about the cup of water you've offered to to DACA kids, to, to mm -hmm. immigrants. Uh, what are you saying to them? How are, you applying, how are you applying your conservative compassion to them? To DACA kids, uh -huh. I have every bit of compassion for a kid who was brought here by their parents. They had no, no say-so in whether they were here or not here, so I get it. And I okay. get that they have hopes and dreams and aspirations. I get it. But you know what I also get? That there's a kid in Appalachia who has hopes and dreams. 
There's a kid in inner city Chicago that has hopes and dreams. And in a country with limited resources, I just like to say Americans have dreamers too. And if we have an order, let's take care of our American dreamers. And we can get to the DACA ones eventually. Uh, but let's take care of American dreamers first with our limited resources. And um, I think that, uh, that there should be a pathway to citizenship for those individuals. But I also think it does a terrible disservice to the, to the folks that I know that stood in line, went through the processes, respected our laws, spent the hard-earned dollars to do what needed to be done in order to become American citizens. Right before taking over as the president of the Heritage Foundation, I had the privilege of going to Ellis Island. And I read the stories of the individuals who sacrificed everything to become American citizens. And citizenship in the greatest country uh, on the planet is something that we should hold up as a, a very valuable thing, an asset, something that we all desire. It should not be something that is so easily attained that all you have to do is sneak across a border to get it. And so I have every bit of compassion for those individuals, but I also have a great deal of compassion for those who did it right, and it's just not fair to them. Okay, so I'm going to ask you one more Oprah question, oh, but, I don't, but I don't want you I don't want you looking at me and saying Oprah, then I think I'll move to George Clooney perhaps. Oh dear. <laughs> so, you know, Clooney and Oprah will be the, yes. will be the, the leading contenders in, 19, okay. in 2020. Um, and so Oprah says, well, that's all very well, and I don't doubt your individual compassion, but then she comes back to you with a, a an emotional, legitimately tear-jerking story about a young person sent back, or a mother sent back, breaking up the family and so forth. So how do you respond to a motion of that sort with real stories in a logical mm -hmm. but also compassionate way? How do yeah, you do it? Well, uh, first of all, I don't discount those stories. They are real. Mm -hmm. And they do uh, prevent a challenge to us as we go through that. And as policymakers, we've got to figure out ways uh, to enforce the law as well as showing compassion. And I think that our lawmakers are doing that as they're looking and fighting for solutions that provide a pathway but also respects the borders of this country. So there should be some, pa in my opinion, there should be some pathways to citizenship, not a free pass. And tell us, and tell us, and I know Heritage has a position on this, which I assume you now share. What exactly is that pathway that you're proposing? <laughs> well, the pathway, uh, as you know, is being debated among our lawmakers, even as we speak. And, and uh, I think the president is a little concerned that they didn't take the opportunity with the last legislative push to do that. But uh, what we're looking at is opportunities for them to, to pronounce themselves, maybe go back to their homeland, do it the right way, fill out the paperwork, re-enter, and have a pathway where they can actually become citizens in this country. Okay. Now, you've had experience dealing sometimes with uh, interesting um, but erratic leaders. I mean, you were a dean uh, at Regent University with Pat what Robertson. What in the world are you talking about? <laughs> so I'm just wondering, I mean, you had, you had, you had experiences, uh, Pat Robertson being a very interesting guy who sometimes does... I'm not sure I would describe thing. him quite the way you did, but okay. Okay. Um, Pat Robertson then to Donald Trump, also a very challenging but erratic leader in some ways. How, how do you see the relationships of, of Heritage and, the, and Donald Trump when Heritage actually does stand for certain things and Donald Trump seems to move back and forth, how do you get along there? Well, you know, it's easy when you have grown up in this country as black, conservative, pro-life, evangelical, all of those things. You pretty much put your stake in the ground and say, this is who I am and I cannot be moved. And so it doesn't matter what's happening in, an, in any way, erratic or not, out there. Uh, when you have your core, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's like a tree planted by the river. We cannot be moved. Which yields so, its fruit in season. <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, when, you are, when you have principles and values, 
uh, that you build your life around. Um, you don't change with the shifting winds. Uh, you don't change with uh, personalities as they come and go. Uh, you are what you are, uh, and, and that is a very comfortable place to be, by the way. Um, I remember when I first had that seminal moment when I realized that. It's when I was the spokesperson for the National Right to Life, and I was challenged with how dare you uh, be used as a tool of the far right. And I never put all the pieces together, but I, at that moment, uh, said to the individual who was challenging me, you know, I don't, I don't sort of base my positions on being a tool of anyone or anything. I, um, I do what I do because I feel called by God to do it. And so I am sitting where I am and believing what I believe, and that won't change, no matter the sort of atmospherics or the politics or um, you know what's going on in the country at any given moment. So it's very important, I think, to get comfortable in who you are and feel comfortable standing there. Well, let me just ask, and this goes back again five years ago. So I just is wanted... this Clooney or is this Oprah? Uh, this, this is, a, this is a, a person from five years ago looking at what you, what you said then and just wondering, because we talked then about, about working within. Now, see, you're making me very cautious about what I say today because five years from now, okay. you're going to read it back to me. Well, okay. but uh, um, you, you, um, you talked about uh, people using each other. Mm -hmm. um, those of us who are black Republicans like to get together when there are no white folks around and talk about how they use us, but we allow them to. They only used us because we let them, because we are pro-life, we do care about that issue, and you use them. I use them, not as effectively as they use me, but I'd like to. You, <laughs> yeah, you can't use me against my will. I'm a conservative because I love my people and believe that conservative values will lift and empower my people. They're not as much conservative as they are biblical values. So how much are you using heritage now as heritage is using you? Totally. Okay. <laughs> okay. And because it's absolutely aligned. Absolutely aligned. Our vision and my vision are one in the same. Now, let me ask a question, and, this, and, and I think things have changed over the years, but I had a, a great year at Heritage way back in 1990 uh, when I was a scholar there for a year, coming from Texas and then going back to Texas. I really enjoyed the people there. But at that time, there was within Heritage a certain debate, certainly. There was, which, which came down, some people talked about Christians versus libertarians. Mm. Um, or in some ways, uh, people more devoted to economic conservatism versus people more devoted to social conservatism. Um, that was a long time ago. What do you see heritage as now? Is it, is it unified on questions? Uh, back then, there was the question of whether heritage would take a strong pro-life position. And at that time, it really did not. I take it that you have taken a strong pro-life position for many years. You'd like it to. How oh, it does. It we... does. I think that, pro that issue must have been resolved okay. years ago. Okay. So what issues are there within Heritage now that still need to be resolved? I'm not telling you. Okay. <laughs> I want to you. Well, you know. Here's I'm... what I will tell you. Okay. Here's what I will tell you. We have, a, we have a Heritage culture and policy that says we speak with one voice. Okay. So some of those issues may get debated, but once they are resolved, that is the heritage position. And, um, and everyone who works there knows that we have the one voice policy. Um, and, um, and so there are times when those kinds of discussions and debates come up. They are healthy. It is important to have those kinds of debates and those kinds of discussions. Uh, but it's pretty much uh, like uh, my husband and me, or when I work for a political uh, leader, that we have those debates internally, and then once we decide what the family believes or what the office believes, that's what we go with. And that's what happens at Heritage. Okay, so the Heritage position now is, is very strongly pro-life. Of that course. It? Okay. Uh, very strongly opposed to same-sex marriage? Yes. Okay. Um, gun control. Let's talk about that issue. We had the big demonstrations mm -hmm. this weekend. 
Uh, you spoke about that a little bit at chapel. Maybe you can, uh, what's the heritage position there? Well, first of all, our position is that, let's start by acknowledging, and I always think, Marvin, it's important to do this. It's important to acknowledge the depth of emotion that people are feeling around this issue right now. Those students who were in those streets genuinely feel unsafe in their schools. They genuinely want answers. And our position at Heritage is that they deserve answers, but they deserve real answers. And so what we know is that most of the violence that happens in schools, it's unrelated to guns. We know that there are other compelling issues surrounding safety in schools that nobody else wants to focus on or talk about. Uh, it's unfortunate that the anti-gun lobby in our country seized upon this as an opportunity to push their agenda when really we ought to be talking about mental health issues. When you look at the backgrounds of so many of the shooters, we know that uh, we should be taking a deeper look at the culture in which we live. What's being produced out of Hollywood? Look at the video games and the violence there. Look at the home life of the individuals who were there. What role does fatherlessness play in all of this? And quite frankly, the issues are complex. They are deep. Many of them are systemic and nobody wants to tackle those. And the kids deserve something way far better than a two word answer, ban guns. Those kids deserve real answers and those kids really deserve safer schools. I wake up at night and I'm concerned about my own grandchildren. I want them in safe schools. And so, you know, I wanted to ask the people who were taking to the streets to, they said they were marching for safer schools. Well, who wants unsafe schools? I mean, who are they marching against or protesting? We all want safer schools. The difference is we want real answers, not mm -hmm. bumper stickers. Okay. Uh, while we're on education, uh, even if schools are physically safe, they're certainly looking at most public schools now, not intellectually safe mm. or intellectually challenging for the most part. Did the Bush administration make a mistake in not really not pushing school choice, but instead emphasizing testing? And if so, how do we overcome that at this point? Well, you want me to sit here and say my boss made a big mistake. Sure. OK. Um, he may have sometimes. It's true. <laughs> he did. He did. But he's not perfect. Right. Um, um, I think that we made a mistake in not pushing both. I won't say that it was, you know, we should have done one and not the other. Uh, school choice is, is, is key, central, to improving the quality of education and the choices available to all kids in this country. And I think one of the arguments that we don't make often enough is that one of the things we believe as conservatives is that free markets reign. Mm -hmm. I promise you that if school choice were enacted and people took their resources and money and picked better schools, you would see the public schools improve because they're going to want to keep those kids. Mm -hmm. Always follow the money and competition works. I am a product of public education. I went to public schools and I under, know- Under great duress. And, under and, great duress, yeah. absolutely. And I, I, I want to see improved and better quality public education. I don't support school choice because I want to see public schools shut down. I don't just support school choice because I want middle class kids to have choices as sometimes is claimed by the opponents of school choice. I want to see poor kids have choice. Mm -hmm. 
And I want to see those kids who are left behind in a public education environment, I want those school administrators to say, if we're going to survive, we've got to compete, and they will therefore improve public education. I sincerely believe that school choice will improve not only the choices made available for the kids who leave, but will force the competition into the public arena, and those schools will improve as well. Will the same thing happen with welfare choice? How would you? In what sense? In what sense the, that instead of when you're uh, unemployed, when you're having some problems going to a welfare office and becoming part of the governmental system, you would have options to go to religious systems of various kinds or secular systems or other things? Well, absolutely. And you know that I believe that in order to turn people's lives around, uh, you, you, and, and to make a profound impact on them, uh, that with all the government programs we can throw at that, if you don't have the faith community involved in some way, you can't get to some of the fundamental and core issues that help people improve their lives. So I think there have to be options for those individuals who would like to go that route. Absolutely. So now you and I have met back in 1995 when you were leading the Virginia campaign towards towards different kinds of choice, including welfare choice and so forth. That was when compassionate conservatism started to be talked about seriously. And then it all seemed to fizzle in the, during the Bush administration. There were some improvements made, but not a whole lot. And now compassionate conservatism sometimes is even a, a dirty word among some Republicans. Uh, what happened? What went wrong? What can we learn from the experience of what went right and what went wrong during those years? Well, let's start with I never liked the term. Okay. Compassionate conservatism. I think it, because? I, because conservatism is compassionate. <laughs> and I don't think that, and I make a point of saying, you know, I, I think we should just stick with conservative because we have got to convince people that being conservative by definition means you are compassionate. I defy, and, and, and see, I say, I think that we have the opportunity to win every Bernie Sanders voter because I defy them to say they care more about poor people than I do as a conservative. Well, let me, let me I just, defy uh, them to say that they care more about quality education than I do as a conservative. I defy them to say that they care more about access to health care than I do as a conservative. And so I don't want to add the descriptor compassionate to conservatism because I think conservatism by definition is compassionate. Except that the people who didn't want you to go to public school call themselves conservatives. Mm -hmm. Right? They were there and, and they were I just... am liberating the term. Okay. I am setting it free. All right. I am reclaiming my time. <laughs> so, okay, now, uh, well, let me just ask one other question about, you're, you're saying the conservative by its very nature, properly understood, yes. is compassionate. Yes. But the understanding often isn't there. Is yeah. there. Does there have to be a battle within the conservative movement to emphasize compassion over the normal tendencies and pressures that a lot of us have. Oh, absolutely. And that's been my passion and my mission for lo these many years, is to convince conservatives that we need to talk about the things that we believe in different ways, with different language, in order to be believable. You know, just recently I said to a group of conservative uh, interns, and I should have asked this question of the Patrick Henry students earlier. Uh, how many of you are here today to learn the, the requisite skills and knowledge and the ability to go out and annihilate the opposition? And I was, you know, they go, yeah, your Patrick Henry students didn't. I didn't get to ask them, but I did ask the interns, yes, and, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm all in. How many, how many of you out here want to <laughs> annihilate the opposition? Is there any hands up? No. No, yeah. okay. no. <laughs> and and these are the smart ones. Um, because what I said to them is our job isn't to annihilate the opposition. Our job is to win them in winsome and compelling ways to win them over. 
and to make sure that they understand that our arguments are the best, that our arguments are, are compelling. So I say to conservatives that we don't really uh, make the case to the very people that we are trying to win. Um, our numbers could be shrinking, could be smaller. We have got to expand the movement. So the job of the conservative is not just to annihilate the opposition, but our job is to go out and win them over to our side. Okay, I have one. I have two more questions for you. Number one. Okay, is this uh, George or is this Oprah? No, this this is just this is just me here. Okay. Little little yeah. Um, when it comes to poverty fighting. Yes. Uh, what is conservative poverty fighting? Let's not mm -hmm. talk then about compassion and conservatism as such, but what is conservative poverty fighting? What principles do we need to put into place and what programs would you want to see right now well, in reforming welfare? Well, that's a, another hour-long conversation and I know it's something you feel passionately about, as do I. But um, in the limited time we have left, I would just say that what I observed uh, in the policy arena for oh, lo, so these many years is the unintended consequences of their misguided compassion, the unintended consequences. Those individuals who have been working in the poverty arena are good people who genuinely care about the poor in this country, but I think that their misguided compassion has led them to put things into place which actually cripple poor people, which actually sap them of hope and opportunity rather than compel them to living lives of freedom and living lives of empowerment. And so any policy, and you can go right through and we could have a great policy discussion where uh, you cripple someone by providing them resources for a lifetime as opposed to giving them the help they need and the skills they need so that they can live self with a, a, a modem of decency and self-sufficiency and independence from their government. And those are sort of the overwhelming, the overriding principles. And then you can take that and look at any particular program and see, does this program with its policies and what it does for poor people trap them in a cycle of dependency or does it give them the skills that they need to lead self-sufficient and independent lives? So the key question is not how much it costs, but how much it actually costs the individuals we're, we are supposedly helping. Oh, my word. You know, cost is such, such a bad measure of whether or not something is working. The dollars that you throw at a program have nothing to do with outcomes. I'm interested in outcomes. Okay. Well, you've been a very good sport here putting up <laughs> with my questioning. So I'm going to give you one. This, is, this goes way back to Clarence Thomas's autobiography, uh. where he says, this is when things were the hardest, some of the older people here will remember for Clarence Thomas under, undergoing enormous abuse. Here's what he writes. Before going to bed, we asked four of our friends, mm -hmm. Elizabeth and Stephen Law and Kay and Charles James, to come over the next morning and join us in prayer. They showed up bright and early, carrying bags of donuts and bagels past mm -hmm. the reporters camped outside the house. The six of us chatted for a little while, then sat in a circle, held hands and asked the Lord for help. Both couples came back each day mm -hmm. until the battle was over and their company was a priceless gift. Quote, where two or more of us are gathered in my name, Jesus said, I am there among them. He was among us now. Uh, Can you just tell us a little bit more about that, that experience with Clarence Thomas? Well, only that that's an experience that has been repeated m more times than I like to think of with friends that are going through difficult times through uh, marriage, through uh, nomination processes. But what's at the core of that that I think we need to remember is we need to be a people who have the audacity to believe in prayer. Mm -hmm. We need to be a people, even when we see the overwhelming challenges that we face as a country today, to know that we serve a mighty God and that we can go to him in confidence and in prayer and know that the battle is not ours, it's his. Amen. It's, 
It's 12.10. Please join me in thanking Kate Cole James. Hold <laughs> on. Well All right.